the 2021 John Snow Society Pump Handle Lecture. My name is Oliver Cumming and I am a co-chair of the John Snow Society. The John Snow Society exists to promote the life and works of the great John Snow, uh, the pioneer of epidemiology and celebrated uh, anaesthetist. If you'd like to find out more about the society or even join, you can do this at our website. Uh, there are a few quick points of order. Firstly, the lecture will close at 7 p.m. and the annual general meeting of the society will open shortly after on the same link uh, and you are all welcome to join. Please note that the lecture itself is being recorded. During the lecture, if you would like to pose a question to the speaker, please type it into the question bar and our moderator will then endeavour to cover as many questions uh, as possible within the time available. So, to the lecture and our distinguished speaker, Dr. Anthony Fauci, whose lecture is entitled COVID-19, Lessons Learned and Remaining Challenges. I fear Dr. Fauci, especially after the last year, needs no introduction. The convention, of course, dictates, I say, at least something about his remarkable career. Born in Brooklyn in New York, his career in health began very early as a young man delivering prescriptions from the family pharmacy. He later attended medical school at Cornell University, graduating top of his class in 1966. After completing his medical residency, he joined the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease as a clinical associate. And in 1984, at the tender age of just 43, he became director of the Institute, a post that he still holds uh, today. Over decades, Dr. Fauci has been a prolific researcher, an advocate for investment in science and public health uh, action. His contribution to the field of HIV AIDS in particular stands out. His list of awards and honours is long and includes the Lasker Prize. Maybe not an official honour, but last year bakeries in New York even produced donuts in his image in recognition of his service to public health. Along the way, he, advised no, he has advised no fewer than seven US presidents, navigating no doubt very different administrations and very different personalities. Throughout, he has flown the flag of science high, providing a clear voice of reason at difficult moments. My own term as co-chair of the John Snow Society ends today, so this is the last time I will introduce a pump handle lecture. And I want to say that I'm very pleased indeed that I should end with the honor of inviting Dr. Fauci to give the 2021 pump handle lecture. Uh, Dr. Fauci, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Cumming. It is a truly extraordinary privilege and honor to have the opportunity to deliver the pump handle lecture to the John Snow Society, uh, one of the extraordinary honors, and I will value and treasure it forever. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. As you heard in the introduction, I'll be speaking about lessons learned and remaining challenges. So. Uh, on the first slide, this is a, a commentary that I wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association a year ago last January. As you could see from the title, it is coronavirus infections more than just the common cold. I was by no means trying to be facetious by saying that at the time, at the very first week or two, of the recognized outbreak, I wanted to bring to the attention of the readers of the viewpoint that we had been involved in knowing about and studying coronaviruses for decades and decades. In fact, on this phylogenetic tree, as you see in the red font, are the human coronaviruses and those that are highlighted in yellow are those that are what we refer to as the common cold coronaviruses that are responsible for anywhere from five to 30% of all the recurrent upper respiratory infections that we all generally experience, usually during the winter months. However, in 2002, began a series, which we are now totally involved in, of the emergence of pandemic potential and pandemic reality coronaviruses, starting with SARS in 2002 and MERS again 10 years later in 2012. So let's take a look at the original SARS shown here again on the phylogenetic tree. 
It began in November of 2002 in the Guangdong province of China and was felt to be an atypical type of influenza pneumonia. But a few months later, when people from Guangdong went from Guangdong to Hong Kong and stayed at the Metropole Hotel and spread it among 19 individuals, and then from there went to many countries throughout the world, we had the first pandemic of a coronavirus. 8,000 cases and almost 800 deaths, importantly, completely contained and ultimately eliminated by rather standard type of public health measures of identification, isolation, and quarantine without any pharmacological intervention. Then 10 years later came the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Again, the first report from Saudi Arabia in which a novel coronavirus was isolated from person with an unexplained pneumonia. This was a bit different than the original SARS because it was more smoldering with multiple introductions into the human species. In fact, we still have introductions to this day with about 2,500 total cases with a very high case fatality rate. The case fatality rate for SARS-1 was about 10%. That for MERS is over 35%. And as you could see, although it can be classified almost as a pandemic, there are still about 85% of the cases are in Saudi Arabia. Let's move now to the present. In the first week or 10 days of January of 2020, a typical type of unexplained severe pneumonias were reported from the Wuhan district of central China, which seemed to be linked to the wet markets in Wuhan. The Chinese quickly on the 9th and 10th of January published in a public database the sequence of this novel genome of a novel coronavirus which was implicated in the pneumonias in Wuhan. Here is its place in the phylogenetic tree, as we'll get to in a moment, among the beta coronaviruses. Fast forward to today, data as of yesterday, showing about 223 million cases and over 4,500,000 deaths globally. The United States is one of a handful of countries that has been hit the hardest with 40 million cases and almost 650,000 deaths. If one looks at the patterns of this surges, what we see in the United States is in some respects similar to what other countries have experienced. With a surge in the early spring, which we thought was extremely serious without fully realizing that in the early summer, an even more serious surge. And then in the late fall of 2020, early winter of 2021, a profound, highly inflective curve of a major surge that went up and then plateaued down around April of 2021, but never went down to a very, very low level. And here again today, in the summer of 2021, we are in the middle of yet again, another surge where as of yesterday, the daily average is 159,000 cases per day. Comparable to the United Kingdom, if you look at the pattern of cases per million people and the surges that we experience, we see now that apart from that rather strong blip in the blue in the midsummer in the UK, 
we are now about the same in the rolling out of the dynamics of the outbreak. Let's now move a bit to the virology. As I mentioned earlier, SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus, an RNA virus with a large genome of 30,000 kilobases, four structural proteins, including the well-known S or spike protein with its receptor binding domain that binds to the ACE2 receptor on a number of cells in the human body, upper and lower airway, GI tract, and endothelial cells in multiple tissues. The transmission is now well established. Exposure to infectious respiratory fluids. And as the weeks and months went by, we painfully learned more and more about the transmission of this extraordinary virus. We knew from the beginning that inhalation of very small respiratory droplets was the standard way a respiratory borne illness is spread. But it was only after considerable observation that it become clear that aerosol particles also are a major modality of transmission. These are deposited on the mucous membrane of the mouth, the nose, or the eyes. Transmission although some attention was paid to it, is much, much less common through contact with contaminated surfaces and fomites. And as we now know from clinical experience, the risk is greatest in enclosed spaces with poor ventilation and during behaviors such as exercise, hence the increased transmission in gymnasiums, singing, hence increased transmission in choirs within churches, and prolonged indoor exposures, in which there have been several super spreading events. Some other very interesting and somewhat unique aspects of this extraordinary virus is that at least one third of individuals never develop any symptoms at all. Most extraordinary for a virus that has already killed well over 4 million people globally and about 650,000 people in my own country. Another interesting and elusive fact about this virus was something we did not appreciate at all in the first months of January and February of 2020. And that is that close to 60% of all transmission are from an asymptomatic person. Someone who is pre-symptomatic and, and might develop symptoms a little bit later and others from individuals who never develop symptoms. It was this observation which confounded us early on before we made masks an important component of the non-pharmacological prevention modalities. When this was recognized as an important modality of transmission, it became clear that masks were very important to be used. So what are some of the fundamentals to prevent the acquisition and transmission? First and foremost, as we all well know, and we're very fortunate to have it, vaccinations. In addition, as mentioned a moment ago, the wearing of masks or cloth face coverings, physical distancing, avoiding congregate settings, doing things outdoors much more preferentially than indoors. And as is usually the case with any respiratory illness, the frequent washing of hands. Diagnostics are straightforward. The gold standard are the molecular PCR tests, usually from a nasal swab. And these are highly sensitive and highly specific. Lately, there has been much more use 
of a less sensitive antigen test used much more for surveillance than for specific diagnosis. And then of course, antibody test to determine whether an individual has been exposed previously and infected, now also used to determine the level of laboratory immunity following vaccination. The clinical manifestations are protean. As I mentioned, notwithstanding the high proportion of people who never develop any symptoms, those who do present with symptoms present with almost a flu-like syndrome with the signs and symptoms shown on this slide. Importantly, there is a unique aspect of this, and that is the loss of smell and taste, which precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms and often lingers following so-called resolution of the syndrome. For those who do develop symptoms, about 80% are mild to moderate, whereas about 15% are either severe or critical, leading to an overall case fatality rate of symptomatic individuals of about 2.3%, much higher up to 20% in those requiring respiratory ventilation and assisted mechanical ventilation. There are individual groups of individual people who are at an increase for severe illness. First and foremost are the elderly. Next are people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions. Foremost among these are obesity of interest. Also chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, liver and renal disease, diabetes, among others. These are some of the protean manifestations of severe disease, dominated by the acute respiratory distress syndrome, but also involving cardiac dysfunction, kidney disease, neurological disease, a very interesting hypercoagulable state, and hyperinflammation, usually in the advanced stage of disease. There's also an interesting multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, very reminiscent of the Kawasaki syndrome of acute vasculitis. Here are some of the representative examples of advanced disease. A patient on the left showing a CT scan of a normal lung and a patient on the right with the profound and dense pulmonary infiltrates seen on individuals, usually those who may go on to have the necessitation of mechanical ventilation. Neurological disease in this particular patient of ours at the NIH, actually this was not, this was a patient reported in the literature, excuse me, but we had similar patients in my own institution with bilateral cerebral infarct shown on the CT as well as on the pathological specimen. Again, of interest and somewhat unique are post-COVID-19 conditions. And we can generally segregate them into two separate buckets. One in which there's residual organ system dysfunction that is directly explainable by organ system damage. For example, if you had pulmonary infiltrates as shown in one of my previous slides a moment ago, it would not be unexpected that you might have chronic pulmonary functional residual abnormalities. That's explainable by a pathophysiological process. However, there are now a number of individuals, anywhere from 10 to up to 30%, who following clearance of the virus and supposed essentially termination of the disease, that these individuals have the signs and symptoms that are not completely explainable 
by a readily apparent pathogenic process. We refer to this as long COVID. And the symptoms are somewhat consistent, including extreme fatigue, sometimes incapacitating, unexplained shortness of breath, muscle aches, <clears throat> dysautonomia, manifested by temperature dysregulation and unexplained tachycardias, sleep disturbances, depression and anxiety, and a condition referred to as brain fog, which means a very curious inability to focus or concentrate, particularly when trying to, fun to follow something on a screen on a computer. So what about the medical management of SARS-CoV-2 individuals? There are three general components. First is the control of symptoms, which often can be done on an outpatient basis. Anti-inflammatories, antipyretics, and just symptomatic treatment with good hydration. For those who have end organ disease, this almost invariably requires hospitalization and a number of end organ supports are given predominantly giving, vac giving oxygen for hypoxemia, intubation, and where necessary, mechanical ventilation. Also, people who have renal failure often require dialysis, as well as a variety of other organ system supports. But I want to spend a moment or two on talking about where we are in the arena of antivirals and immunomodulators. When one looks at the approach to a patient, you can target the virus itself. And there is already an FDA approved antiviral of modest efficacy called remdesivir. What has gained a considerable degree of favor of late are combinations of, broad, of monoclonal antibodies which have received an emergency use authorization for administration. A number of other antivirals are in various stages of clinical trial. And you likely will be hearing more about that in the future. In addition, again, an unusual component of a viral disease. As you get advanced disease, you often see an aberrant or out of control immunological or inflammatory response. Probably the best antidote against this is the commonly used dexamethasone given for 10 days at six milligrams a day. We are also now using, and a few of these have received FDA authorization, are interventions that interfere with various components of the inflammatory response, such as IL-6 or the JAK kinase pathway. Tocilizumab and baricitinib are two of those that are recommended for individuals also on dexamethasone. And then there are also adjunctive therapeutics such as anticoagulation where appropriate. One of the things that are being very actively pursued of late is the identification of vulnerable targets on the SARS-CoV-2 replication cycle and the design or development of drugs that inhibit these vulnerable targets. This is exactly the strategy that was used so overwhelmingly successfully in the development and the design of antiretroviral drugs for HIV, which has allowed us to now have combinations of drugs that have really totally transformed the therapy of HIV infected individuals. And also this approach was applied to the development of drugs 
for hepatitis C virus. And here's an example of a schematic diagram of the replication cycle of SARS-CoV-2, leading us to appreciate multiple potential targets for antiviral therapeutics, such as entry inhibitors, protease inhibitors, and polymerase inhibitors. And in fact, as I speak to you now, several of these are now in various stages of clinical trials for efficacy. In order to push the envelope even further and to underscore the importance that is placed in the development of antiviral treatment, the Biden administration has invested $3.2 billion from the American Rescue Plan as an investment in the development of antiviral drugs. We refer to it as the antiviral program for pandemics, which are aimed at catalyzing the development of new drugs to combat COVID-19 and prepare for other pandemics. It has two pillars, the development of already existing drugs that have not yet been proven in clinical trials, some of which may be repurposed drugs namely accelerate their development. The other is discovery, which means to preemptively design molecules that would be targeted against the vulnerable sites on the replication cycle. Let me turn now to one of the most exciting and successful aspects of the overall effort to address COVID-19, and that is the area of vaccines. Some of you may recall that in the December 2020, less than one year following the recognition of COVID-19, the success of the vaccine endeavor was so striking that Science Magazine voted COVID-19 vaccines as the science breakthrough of the year. So let's take a moment or two to go through that extraordinary process. I wrote a commentary in science a few months ago to try and explain what I referred to as the story behind the COVID-19 vaccines. And in it, I said, that the speed and efficiency, because everyone asked, how could it take such a short period of time, 11 months, to go from identification of a virus to successful vaccines, when generally this takes years? Well, as I said in this commentary, that speed and efficiency in which these highly efficacious vaccines were developed and their potential for saving millions of lives was actually due to an extraordinary multidisciplinary effort involving fundamental basic research, preclinical and clinical science that actually had been underway full blown out of the spotlight, out of the radar screen, literally for decades before the unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me explain in a little detail about that. When you think of a vaccine construct, you think of the immunogen and the platform. So let's take a look at this highly successful immunogen for COVID-19 vaccines. It was developed based on what we call structure-based vaccine design, which really started in its heyday with HIV vaccinology, in which investigators throughout the world, including at my own institution, used structure-based vaccine design with cryo-electron microscopy to determine the most appropriate, stable, conformational structure of their pre-fusion HIV envelope 
to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. Of note, we have not yet been successful in inducing it, though the research is extraordinarily eloquent. However, this eloquent research was applied to other pathogens. In this case, respiratory syncytial virus, in which one of the investigators in our vaccine research center, my colleague Barney Graham, who was interested in respiratory syncytial virus, used the same structure-based vaccine design to stabilize the prefusion F protein of respiratory syncytial virus, turning it into a very successful development of a respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. Now, I mentioned MERS a little bit ago. When one looks at the vaccine that we were developing for MERS that we never really needed, again, we used the structure-based vaccine design to develop the prefusion spike antigen. And as we know now, that is the key to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, the stabilized prefusion spike immunogen. And note the authors on this study include Dr. Graham and Dr. McClellan and others who were involved in this early on in collaboration now with a number of investigators throughout the country and the world. The secret to it all was to use the mutations that were developed to stabilize other prefusion protein, to stabilize the spike protein in its prefusion form, which served as the immunogen for virtually all of the vaccines that were currently tested and used in the United States and in other regions of the world. And this is that classic paper showing the cryo-EM structure of the prefusion confirmation. The red squiggly line is the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. But it didn't end with the immunogen. One of the most important, but not the only, vaccine platform is the mRNA, but a number of other vaccine platforms were used. The mRNA with Pfizer and Moderna, but also the adenovirus, the chimp adeno with the AZ and the Oxford candidate, the human adeno with the J&J &J Janssen, and now we have a number of other candidates using recombinant proteins, such as Sanofi and others, and Novavax, again, with and without adjuvants. But there is a very interesting story that some of you may know about the origin of the mRNA platform. And it started with two now very well known and recognized and honored investigators, Katie Carrico and my former fellow, Drew Weissman, who showed years ago that they could modify the mRNA molecule so that it doesn't trigger key inflammatory pathways, thus overcoming a major hurdle in the use of mRNA as a vaccine. The adenovectors, again, resulted from years and years of research, predominantly in the field of HIV, where Dan Baruch at Harvard and his colleagues developed the AD26 vector predominantly for HIV, but has now been successfully used in Ebola, and now most recently with the J&J &J Janssen product for COVID-19. These are the three platforms, the developers, and the status of the vaccines used and tested for use in the United States. I'm not including here other vaccines, such as the Russian vaccine, the Chinese vaccine, the Indian vaccine, as well as 
a number of others that have been used. I show this because as you could see, on the right hand side, Moderna has received an EUA and is applying for its full approval. BioNTech Pfizer has received a full approval. J&J &J is in an EUA and the others are now applying for full approval. So let's take a look at these representative vaccines in three categories. First, the efficacy in clinical trials. I remember very clearly sitting outside of the room I'm in now in my own home when the CEO of Pfizer called me up on a Sunday night and said, Tony, are you sitting down? And I said, well, no, but I will. And he said, we just got the results of the Pfizer product and it's over 90% efficacious in the clinical trial. I was stunned because we were hoping for about a 70% efficacy. Soon thereafter, literally the next week, the product that we were working on in our vaccine research center, the Moderna product, came in with a clinical trial efficacy very similar at 94%. J&J, &J, which was looking at this throughout the world, including Brazil and South Africa, had an overall 66%, but in the United States, a 72% efficacy, which is really quite good. People should not be put aback by the fact that we have two that are in the 90s, but 72% is a good degree of efficacy. But more important, then what goes on in the clinical trials is what about the real world effectiveness as opposed to efficacy? And the data now are even more encouraging. These are just two examples of a very large cohort study of almost 24,000 people at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center on the, right, the left-hand part of the slide which showed a 0.05 infection rate among fully vaccinated employees, dramatically lower than the unvaccinated. The US CDC showed a report of eight different locations, again, with a dramatic diminution. If one looks at the comparison of incidence of disease, hospitalization, and death, in vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals in the United States, there's an eightfold diminution in disease, a 20-fold, 25-fold diminution in hospitalizations, and a 25-fold reduction in death, comparing fully vaccinated with unvaccinated. The Israelis did a very important observational study on the national surveillance involving literally hundreds of thousands of people. And the results for the Pfizer, excuse me, for the Pfizer BioNTech was striking. If you looked at over 200 million person years total, when the variant was the B117, the alpha, what you saw was a high degree of real world effectiveness in every component of the disease, from asymptomatic to symptomatic to hospitalization and death. And this was across all age groups, as shown on this slide, with 94 to 96% in young individuals, middle aged individuals, and elderly individuals. But all is not rosy because we in the field and certainly in the UK are being faced with the impact of SARS-CoV-2 variants, which result from constellations of mutations, usually around the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, which lead to either increased transmissibility and or increased severity. So let's take a look at the impact 
of these variants on vaccine effectiveness. These are the list of the vaccine, excuse me, of the viral variants. They have now been given by the WHO Greek letter names. The one that is dominating throughout the world, certainly in the United States and the UK, is the Delta variant, formerly known as B.1.617.2. Right now, the Delta variant is seen in at least 136 countries throughout the world. It is different than the other variants for its transmissibility is at least two times greater than the alpha variant. And when you look at the viral loads in the nasopharynx of people infected with Delta, it's up to a thousand times greater than the alpha variant. Now, if you look at the hospitalization risk with Delta, we're starting to get data that indicates that not only is it more transmissible, but it might in fact have a greater degree of severity. Although additional data are coming in that may or may not verify this. But the important question that we're all asking is what happens to the effectiveness of two doses of Pfizer, which represents really almost the same as Moderna in many respects, against the alpha versus the delta in three separate regions of the world. So the red dot, the red triangle is delta, the blue dot is alpha. In England and Scotland, there was a certain diminution in the effectiveness against infection, but the effectiveness against hospitalization with the 96% seemed to hold true. The same with Canada, diminution in symptomatic disease, but not so in protection against hospitalization. But Israel has been a very interesting phenomenon to observe because they seem to be ahead certainly of the United States in every element of the outbreak, including response to vaccines. And as you can see, they have a dramatic diminution in symptomatic disease protection by vaccine. And although earlier studies showed that hospitalization protection, most recent studies in my personal communication with Israeli health authorities indicate that there's even now a significant diminution. Here's some of the data from the United States. This is effectiveness against infection. And these are cohorts of studies, New York State, Mayo Clinic, nursing homes. As you can see, the, the effectiveness against infection and mildly symptomatic disease diminishes. We're only starting to see the early inkling of diminution of protection against hospitalization, as shown as the Mayo Clinic Pfizer green that went from 85 to 75, and the Mayo Clinic, which went from 91 to 81. Now, if you look at Israel in documented infections, and severe in the red, look at the severe on the right, in fully vaccinated people during the Delta wave in Israel, a profound change in July and August, which was somewhere around five or six or so months following the beginning of their vaccination, indicating a waning of immunity and or the effect of the Delta variant, which leads us now, what about booster shots for SARS-CoV-2, a subject of intense interest and debate throughout the world. I'm gonna quickly show you 
what the immunological basis to support a third booster. Antibody levels decline over time. Higher levels of antibody are associated with higher levels of efficiency of vaccine. Higher levels of antibody may be required to protect against Delta. And a booster definitely increases antibody titers. So very quickly, this is here now, antibody levels over time following two shots of a Moderna vaccine. As you can see, from the time you give the second dose at day 28, antibody protection and neutralization in a pseudovirus assay diminishes to all variants. This slide shows a correlative immunity. On the left, the solid black line is vaccine efficacy that you see increases as you get a greater titer of neutralization. So that when the red line crosses the black line at a titer of one to 100, the vaccine efficacy is 91% and continues to go up as you get a better neutralization titer. Here, in comparing the open circles to the pink, you see that you require 2.4 times greater antibody titer to neutralize delta compared to alpha. In this case, it is an alpha, it's the D614G. That's for Moderna. And on the right-hand side of the slide, very similar results for Pfizer. Now, here's something that's very important. If you look at the immunogenicity after boosting with a 50 microgram of Moderna, namely a third shot. So if you look at the far left against the D61G, day one is just before the third dose. D15 is 15 days after the third dose. Dramatic increases in neutralization titer, 23 times higher, 32 times higher, 44 times higher. This is for Moderna. If you look at Pfizer, the same thing. Following dose three, dramatic increases of more than 11 fold if you compare it with the post dose two. So the real question that we're struggling with now with regard to boost the doses, is the booster shot a boost for a vaccine regimen with waning efficacy? Or is the booster shot actually, should that be part of the original vaccine regimen? And I must tell you, I favor very strongly the latter because there are examples of vaccines with multiple dose primary series, including and importantly, hepatitis B and inactivated poliovirus and pneumococcal conjugate. And so if one looks at the latest data from a few days ago, what happens when you boost with a third dose in the Israeli cohort? 12 days or more after the booster dose, there was a tenfold decrease in the relative risk of both confirmed infection and severe illness. Also, if you look at the odds of testing positive, namely protection against infection, comparing two with three doses, there was up to a 68% reduction in risk of infection and up to 84% reduction in the risk after 14 to 20 days compared to seven to 13 days. Before I close, I wanna recognize something that's on everyone's mind, is giving boosters in countries like the United States, Israel, the European Union, UK, at a time when the rest of the world, barely in many countries, has their first dose, as shown by Africa on the bottom of the slide. And it's for that reason 
why I feel personally, and we in the United States feel strongly, that we can do both. We can do a booster program at the same time as dramatically increase the doses going to low and middle income countries, which is the reason why we have already given over 100 million doses to 90 countries, and we'll be giving a half a billion doses by the time we get into 2022. So I wanna make sure people appreciate that we understand the sensitivity of this and we feel we should really push as best as we possibly can to accomplish both, to get the world vaccinated at the same time we get the proper regimen. And I wanna close with this slide, which is really a schematic cartoon of what is really going on here. We are truly in a race against SARS-CoV-2. And the horse that we are riding is the vaccine horse. And for that reason, it's so critically important that we do whatever we can to get as many people vaccinated in our own country and throughout the world as we possibly can, as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you for your attention. Well, Dr. Fauci, thank you very much indeed. Uh, my name is Jimmy Whitworth, and I, together with uh, Oliver, uh, a, a co-chair of the John Snow Society. Um, we've got over 1,800 uh, attendees at this lecture at the moment, um, and you can imagine a, a very large number of questions have come in. So what I will do is try to uh, coordinate that and uh, act to uh, ask you if you could please respond to uh, uh, some of the questions that have, have come up today. Um, so le let me start off. Um, really from uh, early on in your, your talk, you were talking about MERS, and we've got a question about how confident are you about the uh, extremely high IFR for MERS? Do you think that this is um, actually accurate? You know, um, that is a really good question. Uh, I think it is approximately accurate. I believe the questioner was asking a likely a subtext of the question was, did we really screen enough people to see if there was asymptomatic infection? And could be that there were many people who had asymptomatic infection. From what we can tell Dr. Whitworth, that they did do some significant screening in Saudi Arabia, and they found that there was not that degree of asymptomatic infection that we were seeing with SARS-CoV-2, but it is a good question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, here's a good one for you early on. Um, in your experience, what would you say is the biggest challenge of scientific research uptake into US policy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, th th thank you for the question. You know, one of the problems, it's no secret to the rest of the world that there has been an extraordinary, unprecedented degree of divisiveness in my country, which has really led to a, 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 a disturbing pushback on the scientific process, where with social media essentially compounding the problem, we have had many unscientific and, in fact, frankly, disinformational uh, material going around that has made it very, very difficult to get the general public to get a crisp, clear message of what it means to follow the science. And it dates back to false claims of the efficacy of therapies such as hydroxychloroquine, um, also things like a lack of appreciation that we were really dealing with a fulminant outbreak when people were saying it's just gonna spontaneously go away. 
those are the kind of things that really made it very difficult for the scientific community, including myself. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think we all saw um, some of that from from the uh, from the outside as as bystanders. There, I guess another element of that is another question that's come in, and that's uh, asking what you think are the biggest public misunderstandings of the way that scientists advise government. So people looking, the public looking at that interaction between policy makers and scientists? Yeah, I, th that's a good question. Uh, at least in the situation that I am currently in now with the Biden administration, there is no doubt that we have the signal that we have to make science rule. Follow the science is the word that has been used repetitively from the president to all of us on his medical team. Whether it's good news or bad news, follow the science. Under other circumstances, messaging sometimes got in the way of what was going on scientifically. So I think the biggest challenge is to stay scientifically accurate at the same time that you give a measured message. You don't wanna panic the public, but you don't wanna hold back information that's factual and important. So that's really the balance you're trying to do. I mean, uh, literally, as I speak to you now, as soon as we're finished, <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, I'll be getting in the limo to go to the White House to talk to the president about what the message is gonna be about looking forward to what we have to look forward to in the context of variants in the context of vaccination. And he's gonna want the pure scientific facts. And we're gonna try and figure out what the most honest way of conveying that to the American public. Wow, wow. Well, there will be a chance to rehearse that because coming up is a question, something <laughs> along those, those lines. Um, but just before we come there, there's a, a question from Hannah who asks, if most transmission is inhalation of droplets or aerosol and very little from contaminated surfaces, why is hand washing so important in prevention? You know, that is a very good question. And the reason is for a very brief period of time, when people sneeze or cough, they sometimes put the hand in front of it. So the droplet may be there for a very brief period of time. And if you then put your hand to your face the way we often do, you might actually deposit the droplet into your mucous membrane. That's very different from compulsively scrubbing down your doorknobs and scrubbing down when someone delivers the paper to your house, you're afraid to touch it because you feel it's gonna transmit. There's no evidence that it occurs that way, but a droplet on your hand can really last for a few minutes or so. So that's the reason why you wanna wash your hands. Yeah, right, okay. And probably more important than contaminated surfaces and fomites in, in this case. Um, uh, a question about where are we in understanding why some people become sick when they're infected and others don't? Dr. Whitworth, I have been struggling with that for now the entire 20 months that we've been dealing with this. This is so puzzling to me as an infectious disease person and as an immunologist, it obviously has to do with your ability to mount a response, very likely with innate immunity because you don't have enough time to develop adaptive immunity to prevent the virus from going from the upper airway ACE2 receptors down to the lower airway lung ACE2 receptors. And, and I have to be humble about it. I don't, I don't know why that occurs, but it does. Do you think it might be something to do with the size of the infecting dose at all or genetics or? or... Well, I never, rule, <laughs> I never rule out genetics as having an influence on everything that happens in medicine. 
But I think you're absolutely right. It might have to do with the size of the inoculum. Uh, that is possibly uh, makes good pathogenic sense that you could overwhelm the innate immune system if you have a very high inoculum of virus. That would not be the first time that that happens in an infectious disease. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a question about long COVID, and this is from uh, Matthew Loxton asking about the expectations for, for rev resolution of this. Um, what's your understanding of this? Is it likely to be months or years or decades? Uh, is it likely to remain lifelong in some cases? We don't know the answer to that, but we know it's at least measured in months because we have now started a study a multi-NIH Institute study looking at large cohorts of people who have both been infected and uninfected as a control to take a look at this constellation of signs and symptoms. I don't find, uh, as I mentioned in the lecture, you can explain residual organ system damage, but what is completely inexplicable from a pathogenic standpoint is when you have no abnormal laboratory data and someone is incapacitated by fatigue. You know, very, very similar and reminiscent of the myalgic encephalitis chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a question from um, a Joe Biden um, asking about the future um, <laughs> and. Um, Asking what your thoughts are here. Are, are we looking at a disease that is likely to become a seasonal endemic disease over time? And do you think that its virulence would, will remain the same or, or over time as it passages through a human population, do you think it might become um, less uh, severe? Well, I first have to precede my comment, uh, Dr. Whitworth, by saying I don't know the answer to that question. But I somehow in intuitively don't see this as a influenza-like situation where every winter we're left with another version that has to require modifying the vaccine. I see it as something that's going to take, you know, more than a total of two years, because we're already 20 months into it, to get to the point where if you get enough people vaccinated throughout the world, as I mentioned in the lecture, you would diminish or interfere with the pandemic nature of it. So it will become an infection in which there are not very merry, vulnerable people who are unvaccinated. So I would look at it as something more like what happens with measles. When you get 90 plus percent of the world's population vaccinated against measles, in the countries with good vaccination, you don't have a lot of measles, like the United States and the UK. Whereas in other countries in which the vaccination level is low, you do. So again, I have to modestly say, I don't know the answer to the, to the question, but I think it's going to be something that you know, in infection, you have control, elimination, or eradication. We've only eradicated one pathogen, and that's smallpox. We've eliminated polio from any of a number of countries. I would hope we get to the point somewhere between very adequate control and elimination. But I hope that's the case, but we don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, where do you stand on uh, vaccines for children? Um, taking a, a, a broad view, I mean, taking sort of uh, not only their own um, individual um, concerns, but also education um, and society generally. This is, a, this is a hot topic in the UK at the moment. I do know that it's a hot topic. So <laughs> I have to say I'm giving you just my opinion and not any uh, dispersion on the, on, on the decision that the UK authorities have made, which I know is not the sa same decision that we've made in the United States. I do believe, Dr. Woodworth, that we should vaccinate the children. And there are a number of reasons. One, 
that they are vehicles of spread. Two, that we do get some severe disease in children. Right now, if you go to your own media, you will see that in the United States, in the Southern states, Florida, Texas, Georgia, Mississippi, the intensive care units in the pediatric hospitals are full. We're almost overrun. I mean, we have a lot of children in hospitals now. So even though relatively speaking, compared to an adult, they do not get as seriously ill. We have lost more children from SARS-CoV-2 than we ever lose for influenza. And we vaccinate children against influenza. So that's one of the reasons. Number two, apropos of a question you asked me a few moments ago, we don't know what the long-term effects are going to be on anyone, including children. So it may be that, much to our dismay, that children who get infected have long-term consequences that we don't fully appreciate right now. So for those reasons, one of transmissibility and one of seriousness of disease and one of uncertainty about long-range consequences, I, I come down strongly on ultimately vaccinating our children. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, a question about vaccine development and really looking at this from the context of the, uh, the, the recent pandemic. And this is about whether we can rely on commercial industry to develop vaccines for uh, novel emerging pathogens or whether um, institutions such as CEPI, you know, the, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative are, are needed to really push these things through. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I do think we need more than just industry alone. Industry is a necessary, but not sufficient component. So there's no chance that we're gonna do it without industry. But I do believe that organizations and enterprises like CEPI, like Gavi, like what we're trying to do in the United States in supplementing by contractual arrangement, having the government have some degree of control over the ultimate development, I think that's absolutely necessary. So the short answer to your question is that I do believe that we need to go beyond leaving it in the hands of the pharmaceutical company alone. Thank you very much. Now, um, I realize I've been working you very hard here. So uh, one final question, and that is around what you said towards the end of your talk, where you were talking about uh, the possibility of instituting booster doses of vaccination, but also um, uh, ensuring that we have global vaccine equity around the world at the same time. Um, is, that, is that really realistic? Do you think this is something that the global community can put in place? I'm uh, an idealist, cautious optimist, <laughs> Dr. Whitworth. I do believe we can do that. Um, I, can, I believe we can do it by donating doses the way we have. Namely, we're going to be giving a half a billion by 2022. Um, and we're going to increase the capacity of the companies and pay for it, really, in many respects, in order to be able to make more doses for the developing world. I believe if the wealthier or rich countries, as it were, each make a component of what they do. I do believe that within a reasonable period of time, we could supply the rest of the world with vaccines that would have a major impact on the pandemic in their country. I, I do believe we can do that. Okay, well, I think on a um, idealistic but um, uh, optimistic note for this, I'd like to Thank you very much for, for, your, for your lecture, but also for those 
great answers to that wide range of questions that we had there. Uh, thanks very much to all the participants for um, uh, putting in your questions there. I hope I've given you a, uh, a reasonable coverage of all the questions that we came in here. And now let me hand over to Dillis to go through the next stage of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is, is Dillis Morgan, and it's my pleasure to thank you for joining the eminent uh, list of very important pump handle lectures. Thank you very much indeed. We were very honoured to have you here with us this evening, and you certainly didn't disappoint. Uh, in your presentation, COVID-19 Lessons Learned and Remaining Challenges, we learned uh, a lot from your presentation, including in the lessons learned the rapid progression of knowledge about this virus and the resulting disease. But also you emphasised the, um, you know, uh, the role of aerosol particles in transmission and how that changed and the importance of asymptomatic disease, both as part of the spectrum uh, of infection, but also in transmission. You outlined the ever increasing range of symptoms and also of therapeutics and Thank you for uh, spending time going over the vaccines, the development, the future, the successes and the challenges we may yet face. And also many of the questions, you, you didn't see all the questions coming in, but there were lots of questions about the, the, the booster dose or the third dose um, in, in, in the questions. So I thought you preempted a lot of those questions. So thank you very much. So on behalf of the John Snow Society and the 1800 people who joined us online, may I thank you very much indeed, sir, for delivering the pump handle lecture on behalf of the John Snow Society. Thank you very much indeed. Now, the John Snow Society is based on tradition and rituals. Part of these rituals should be that you actually uh, receive your tie, which I hope you will receive at one time, and you will wear with pride. Aha, uh -huh. well, yeah. <laughs> I hope you wear it on your multiple television appearances as our, our chief medical officer does. Um, and also your mug, which uh, I hope when you do have time to relax, you will be able to enjoy and enjoy a cup of coffee in your John Snow mug. So for the next stage is the removal of the um, pump handle. And I'm handing you over to, I'm not sure if it's Marta or Charlie, one of the other members of John Snow Society Committee, will take us through the next stages. So thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. Appreciate it. Hi, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Charlie. I am one of the members of the John Snow Society Steering Committee. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fauci, for coming today. Um, so as many of you who've been to the pump handle lecture previously will know, we ask our speakers to remove the handle of a water pump, as John Snow recommended in 1854. So the John Snow Society has delivered a water pump to Dr. Fauci, which you can see behind him there, the red pump. And I would like to now invite him to remove the handle. Okay, Charlie, I'm on my way, hold on. Fantastic. Here we are. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a brilliant talk. And I will now close this meeting. Um, the members of the society are invited to join the AGM, which will um, start in about five minutes. We're going to have a five minute break and then we'll have our AGM. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Charlie. Appreciate it.
S-M-A-B-A-C-I-L-I